Good evening. Uh, my name's Colm. I'm a principal engineer at AWS. Uh, I've, I've worked at AWS uh, 12 years. My, my first day uh, I joined, uh, you know, my first day at my desk, I was working on Amazon CloudFront, uh, which is our content distribution network. Uh, you know, it's got all these locations out there, and we uh, accept requests and, and then cache content on behalf of customers. Um, and uh, CloudFront is one of our largest uh, data planes. You know, it's, it's uh, this massive service that's handling uh, millions and millions and millions of requests all the time. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, lessons we've learned from building our highest availability data planes. Um, last year, it's kind of a companion talk to a talk I gave last year. So last year, uh, I gave a talk all about how we build control planes. And, um, you know, it was our first time kind of sharing uh, details like this and getting a little more into how we architect things internally. You know, not quite giving away the blueprints to like how to build a DynamoDB or an EBS or S3 or anything like that, but still giving, uh, you know, lessons and patterns that we've learned over the years for how we construct these systems and how we operate at the scale we do and make things really, really reliable and, and secure for customers. And um, so I gave that in talk form and I boiled it down into you know, 10 patterns uh, that we use in no particular order, just kind of cool things to share. Uh, and folks really liked it. It was uh, one of the top rated talks last year. Got lots of feedback from customers, new, you know, other patterns they'd like to hear more about or uh, give us more detail. Uh, we ran the talk series a few more times at like summits and uh, I gave it at some industry conferences like QCon. Um, and so we want to do more of that. Uh, and today I want to share more from, from our data planes. And uh, I'm going to share lessons from data planes that I've worked on directly. So CloudFront, which I already mentioned. I was on Route 53, our DNS service. Uh, our, our, our network, whether that's our physical infrastructure network or our VPC uh, virtual network, uh, these are all systems with massively critical, massively scalable um, data planes that have to stay up and available to you know, an absolutely huge degree. And I'm also going to share lessons that I've gotten from my colleagues uh, from similar services, which I didn't work on directly, but you know, I'm familiar with from going to design reviews and, and uh, working with folks on those teams uh, and from them telling me how they do things, including services like S3 or IAM, our Identity uh, and Authentication Management Service, uh, which is involved in almost every you know, service request that's made uh, to AWS, IAM is involved. Uh, so all, all the lessons I'm going to share today, everything I'm covering, we're going to try and condense down and, and give you a flavor of, of how we operate as teams when we're building those kinds of services, because it, it is a little bit different, um, and some of the technical patterns and tricks that we use to kind of wrangle the complexity and challenges of those spaces. Um, uh, it, is, it can be fuzzy to define, you know, exactly what is a control plane and a data plane. Um, there aren't always perfectly clear boundaries. Um, you know, on, in the principal engineering community at AWS, or at Amazon, I should say, uh, we, we have a mailing list. You know, all the principal engineers are on it, and we frequently have these technical discussions and mini debates and talk about things. And I remember a few months ago, one of our principal engineers just sent, you know, a short, friendly message to the list asking, you know, uh, I've got a service here and I don't really know whether it's a control plane or a data plane. It kind of could be both. Uh, you know, do we have any guidelines? Are there any simple rules I could follow to, to know which kind of bucket it falls into so I can give the team better guidance or tell them who else they should talk to and that kind of a thing? Uh, and you would think that's a very simple question and it might have some simple answers, but I think that thread got, you know, several hundred emails deep as people really got into nuance and went, no, there's no, um, there's no simple answer for this. But at the same time, a consensus emerged that actually people tend to know uh, a control plane when they see one, and they, and they tend to know a data plane when they see one. And so the distinctions we make for typical services, like a service that's like a request reply service that has an API and, and takes some intent from customers, so like we have an API, the customer can call it and say like, I want the service to do X, right? And taking that intent and that desire and then 
propagating that out into state that actually goes to some workers or servers or whatever uh, that actually does the work for real, that we consider the control plane. And, uh, and then the data plane, we generally think of as the place where you know, the, the real work is happening. So for example, for a system like CloudFront, you know, we have an API that customers can call to set up a CloudFront distribution or change settings on their CloudFront distribution, like how long content can be cached for, things like that. You know, that's the control plane. And um, if that has an outage or an availability event, you know, that's a big deal. We've got to fix it really quickly. But it's, it's not quite the same as, um, as CloudFront's data plane, which is the actual workers and servers actually handling the requests and serving people's content to web browsers and so on. And if that were to have an outage or an availability issue, you know, that would be a much, much bigger deal. People's entire businesses would be offline. And um, there's a lot of you know, precedence for high availability engineering and trying to build uh, incredibly reliable systems. So the title of this talk is Beyond Five Nines. Right? We're trying to get more than 99.999% availability, which if you do the math means you know, each service can only tolerate you know, seconds to a very small number of minutes uh, in, in a year, uh, de depending on ways in which you measure it and whether, you're, uh, whether your time period is like the whole year or a month or, and so on. But it's, it's, they're very aggressive goals, incredibly hard to hit. Uh, and there are mature you know, fields of engineering that have been working on these problems for a long time. Uh, you know, telephony engineering has been trying to achieve uh, availability levels similar to that for a very long time. And uh, in fact, like the phrase, you know, carrier grade, when we talk about systems that have carrier grade reliability, we're talking about, you know, telephony carriers in general. Um, and, and that has a lot of smart engineers, a lot of smart people, and 100 years of, of learning lessons in that field. Right? And it's still really, really hard to hit those availability levels. Um, you know, if, if, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not hard in a year to come across a situation where you know, a landline might not work and dial tone's not there, or uh, you know, mobile telephony, which has challenges inherent in the medium of just thin air. There's a lot of places you can't get mobile reception. Um, and there's a lot, you know, there's times we've all had where calls just don't connect through and so on, right? It's really, really hard to get to those availability levels, even though there's a huge amount of uh, availability engineering in there. Uh, another field with a lot of precedence is um, electric, uh, electricity supply and grids um, and electrical engineering in general, where, you know, grids are trying to make sure that electricity is available to every single customer whenever they need it. And uh, this is another field with a lot of smart engineers, a lot of brain power focused on these problems of how do we keep this stuff up and available. Um, and it's still really, really hard, right? I mean, just, just recently we had you know, multi-day outages of massive grid networks um, in, in major populated areas, right? It's because it's really hard to build in all the, the layers of resilience that are needed. Uh, and so you know, systems have to be augmented. And, you know, like for electricity, you can have backup generators and so on. But in our field, we're really, like in the field of, you know, cloud computing or distributed computing, we're really trying to go beyond uh, what those other fields have achieved. Um, you know, our strongest example of that is um, our Amazon Roof 53 service comes with a 100% availability SLA. Uh, and we really do mean that. And we've architected it in a way um, where we're, we're confident as long as the customer uses all four name servers that we give them, we can stand over, you know, at least two of those name servers will for sure be available, and that's enough for their service uh, to work. Um, so they, they, you know, their business won't go off the internet or anything like that. Um, and the ways we're able to do that are, you know, we have advantages that those other fields don't. You know, we can be massively distributed and massively redundant uh, in ways that they don't really get to be. And we try to use that to our advantage. Um, you know, another example is our identity service, which I mentioned I am. Imagine that's being called every single time customers call another web service, right? If somebody accesses S3 or DynamoDB or SQS, they do it with a SIGV4 signed URL. And something has to authenticate that URL, and that's this service. Right, so it's just got 
unbelievably, um, uh, unbelievable amounts of redundancy and resilience and safety engineering built in uh, to achieve that. And then imagine our network where every single packet being processed, you know, it's every, almost every single one, you know, they're all just critical. Uh, it has to make sure that it's got just huge levels of availability. And if you measure it at the per packet level, you know, our network goes way, way, way beyond five nines. It's, um, it's impressive what it's possible to do. Um, so I'm going to share 10 patterns, just, just like we did last year. But one thing I'm going to do a little differently than last year is that the first few I'm going to share aren't technical patterns. We're not going to go straight into how we architect systems or you know, the little technical tricks and tips that we use. And I'm going to talk about something else that I think is much more important, something that sets apart the teams that have to build these incredibly critical systems. And that's just some of the kind of leadership principles and cultural values that uh, we enforce or so reinforce uh, on those teams. And that those teams you know, bring to the table themselves because they operate in a, a very elite space. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, if, if you are on a team that is responsible, for example, for building the Route 53 data plane, answering all of these customers' DNS requests, ensuring that you know, many, many, many businesses uh, stay online, um, it's just kind of a different arena, right? It's just, you're just not, <laughs> the stakes are much higher and you kind of carry yourself uh, differently and you, you pay attention to things in a way um, that you might not elsewhere. And, and I think those tend to be the biggest differences. Uh, at Amazon, we have a set of leadership principles that are just common across the whole company. Um, and we also, in the principal engineering community, have a set of uh, tenets or like design principles that we recommend to folks. So I'm just going to go through some of those and kind of illustrate how the teams use them and integrate them into, into very um, high availability engineering. So the first thing I, you know, I always see in all of these teams that operate these very critical systems is that they just index incredibly high on, on quality, right? On really insisting on the highest standards at all times. Um, you know, to an unusual degree, these teams are um, making time for quality because they know that um, if every you know extra test they add, every extra you know simulation they can run, uh, the more and more prepared they are, um, the better, because they know that the cost of failure is incredibly high, um, and that there's just no point uh, cutting corners and rushing things. Um, that you know it might appear to save you time in the very very short term, but it will never pan out. You know you'll it'll you'll trigger some kind of problem and you'll eat back all of those savings and more, you know, and having to recover from that event and integrate all the new lessons you learn and so on. And what I tend to notice about these teams uh, when they're operating in this, this elite space is that they, um, they integrate quality like intrinsically into how they work. Like there's just no way they would do work any other way. Like they don't budget quality as this extra thing that they add at the end. They don't like write their code and then at the end think, okay, how much time do we have to write tests? Let's you know, spend that time writing tests. They just inherently and intrinsically write code and tests as they go. You know, um, uh, another example of this that I like to use as a metaphor is um, I really like cabinet making. Uh, I did not make any of these cabinets. Uh, this is a stock photo that I'm allowed to use, um, but, they're, but they're still a good example. And one thing you learn uh, really early on when you're, when you're building cabinets is that there is absolutely no such thing in the real world as a right angle. Uh, pretty, pretty much no house uh, or, or physical space has a perfect 90 degree you know, wall in this direction and also 90 degrees perfectly in this direction. And so when you start building these things very naively, right? You go, okay, I'm gonna roughly measure the wall. How, much, how big do I need to build the cabinet? And I go away and you know, make the cabinet. And I come back and it's like, oh, it doesn't quite fit. And then you're like, okay, well, what does it fit? And then you start shaving pieces off and you start squeezing it in. And it's kind of like getting that table to be steady at a restaurant. 
Um, and eventually you kind of get it in there. But you know, most people won't notice, but if somebody's super into cabinet making or, or, uh, or just has a real life or detail, they'll probably notice that it isn't like perfectly level and maybe it's not quite as snug as it could have been and you had to put some extra filler in different places and so on and it's not quite there. Whereas the more mature, experienced person uh, you know, will have learned that like, that approach just doesn't really work. And instead, you, know, you have to go in, you make a template, you cut to that template, and then at you, like, as you're assembling, you're able to still make adjustments so that the final fit is really perfect. And you're kind of in this iteration cycle where you're constantly, you're not just building, but you're also measuring and checking, and you're just doing this in this nice little loop, and quality is kind of intrinsic, and there's, there's no way you could shortcut it. You know, another example I know of is, uh, you know, a friend of mine's an aviation mechanic, um, works for an airplane company, and, uh, you know, learned very early on in his apprenticeship that, like, every single, you know, time he tightens something, he has to check, you know, actually check that the torque was right. And he just doesn't know any other way to do it versus some folks who, you know, just go tighten a bunch and then check them after the fact, but you might miss one, you know, and errors creep in that way. And these, the, the teams, I work with on these data planes, they all work in the like quality is just integral and it becomes just infused whenever you ask them to plan or budget for like, well, how long is it gonna take you to build this? Or how long is it going to you know, take to ship this new feature? They're just automatically and intrinsically budgeting for that amount of quality. Um, it takes a lot of tone setting from leaders, it takes a lot of reinforcement and support, but it's something, something we see a lot of. Uh, the biggest and most obvious way this kind of shows up is that these teams just raise the bar for testing. You would not believe the amount of testing that goes into these data planes. Like, it is um, a high burden. It is, there is typically way, way, way more test code than actual, like, code that's running a data plane. You know, it's, it's not unusual to see in a, in a data plane package uh, that's handling critical workloads, like just thousands and thousands of unit tests, lots and lots of integration tests, lots of regression tests. You know, every lesson we've ever learned gets turned into a regression test so it can never repeat. We'll have pre-production environments that really simulate production as closely as possible. You know, we'll have synthetic workload generators, we'll have synthetic data sets. Um, we'll really try to be able to hammer the code before it ever gets to production. Um, and the team has integrated to the idea that uh, their service has to be highly available, like all the time. And like, that includes when we're deploying the software and when we make mistakes and have to roll back the software. You know, so in their pre-production environment, we'll be hammering their service and checking and measuring its availability level, and they'll do a full you know, roll forward of that software and roll back, um, which they hope never to do in production, but just in case, they'll do it. And, and measure it and make sure that they're still hitting their availability, um, availability targets you know, while that's happening, which is hard. Uh, it also means that when, when we architect and design services, you know, it, it can be very easy to just design a service that like, well, you know, it does X and I write the code and I ship it and it does X. And then, okay, well now version two needs to come along. How do I get it out there? without causing interruption, it's like, oh, well now I'm gonna design that and I'm gonna figure out how to do that. You know, we, we discourage that. We instead think at the beginning, okay, you need to design your service for upgradability and make sure that that's like an intrinsic part of the design. If you wanna get a flavor for any of this, uh, S2N is an open source project we have that I work on. Uh, it's short for Signal to Noise. It's our open source implementation of um, the SSL and TLS protocols. And so those are, that project is maintained by two teams uh, at Amazon. Uh, both teams are front-end data plane teams. You know, they are responsible for the front-end termination for pretty much every AWS service. And like, we're talking services like S3, right? So this, this is one of those teams. And if you're curious, you, know, you can literally go see our GitHub repository, take a look at our tests see what's there. You can look at our code reviews, they're all public. You can see how the team interacts, uh, what, it's, what, it's, um, what its dynamics are, and really get a flavor for, for just how much time we're spending on all of that stuff uh, versus, um, you know, versus writing code that ultimately like, does SSL or TLS. 
uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the ratio is something like 10 to 1 in terms of testing to, to production code. Uh, it, it, it can like really take those levels. Um, you know, we try to integrate all this into our CI CD pipelines. So all of our testing, all of our regression testing, um, you know, we try to automate it all so that this stuff isn't a burden. You know, I'm able to write code, write my tests, you know, send it out for a code review, have it merged, and then like I just forget about it. You know, this stuff just happens in the background and doesn't doesn't have to be driven. The next kind of cultural thing that I see differently uh, with these teams is that they're technically fearless, uh, which is a term I really love. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is really that you know, fear is just not. It's not a. You don't want an environment full of fear uh, on a team. It's. I, I've never seen um, anything except a really healthy team with really healthy cultural dynamics. You know, produce a healthy, highly available service. I think it's the only way to do it. Uh, I think if folks on a team don't feel free to express doubts or raise concerns or even be self-critical and draw attention to themselves and admit you know, mistakes, um, what's going to happen is folks are going to uh, you know, sweep things under the rug. And you're going to have risks buried in a system and a service that you don't want there. right? So you know, when we see people raising risks, uh, we, we promote that, we reward that, we encourage it. It's, it's not at all a bad thing. We definitely don't want to shame people or anything like that. Um, and uh, we, we want to maintain an environment that is, is really strong about that. We never want that other kind of environment where, you know, hey, we're all just trying to hit this date, and we have to you know, ship by this deadline, and we're going to do anything it takes. And uh, nobody even dare you know, raise anything that might stop us or slow us down. You know, that's a very unhealthy environment and something we uh, try to discourage. Um, because we know that ultimately, right, like every feature we have, you know, customers want it, but it's not as valuable as uptime and availability. You know, if we if we have an outage or an availability event, pretty much every customer is going to be upset with us. Uh, we all know that fear leads to the dark side, right? If if um, if people are living in fear, it's just it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be great for anybody. Nobody wants to be in a team like that, but. Fear isn't totally negative either, right? If, if people have fears around things, like these are smart people, right? Like if their intuition, if their gut is telling them there is risk around something, we want to listen to that, right? That's the healthy side of fear. And we don't, you know, we don't ignore that fear and we don't suppress it and we don't, being technically fearless isn't about being brazen and just being like, oh, you know, I, I'm never afraid of anything. Like, I can make any change I want. We're total rock stars. That's not a healthy mindset at all. Instead, it's about, well, you know, I have my doubts and paranoid suspicions. This could go wrong in this way. And addressing that, uh, you know, with deep and data-driven, you know, decision making. Like, really getting into it and being like, OK, well, we have a fear. What can we do to address that fear? What can we really analyze? How can we convince ourselves that that fear is or isn't unfounded? Right? And if it is, do something about it. And if it isn't, move on. But like applying that kind of open-mindedness and professionalism is really, really key. We try to encourage this you know, organizationally. We actually have awards, like the AWS level, for just rewarding individual engineers who raise risks. Um, and it's given a lot of profile. Uh, it's something we really, really try to encourage in our culture. It's cool. So I mentioned testing already. But um, one thing we do differently at AWS with our data planes uh, and, and very high availability services um, that kind of goes beyond testing. So we actually get into modeling them, right? Uh, we, we want, testing lets you, you know, hammer your service and really check all of these conditions that you've thought of. But it's, it's not great for conditions that you haven't thought of. Right? So how do, you, how, do, how, do you, um, how do you get at those? And, and one great way is to build models of systems and then probe those models with you know, mathematical techniques or like fuzz testing techniques, all, all sorts of techniques like that. Uh, if you want to get a flavor for the kind of modeling we do, you know, we've been putting papers out over the last few years. Uh, you can read a paper about, um, that goes into incredible detail about how we built 
uh, the Amazon Aurora data plane, all sorts of little models in there. They'll give you some insight for uh, how we think about that. Uh, we have a slightly older paper that shows how we use uh, a formal um, verification system called TLA Plus for ensuring that our distributed systems are free from race conditions and will achieve consensus when they need to and do the right things when they need to and so on. Um, we have another paper that came out this year on uh, how we do formal verification of Amazon S2N, that TLS project I mentioned. Uh, this paper actually won an award from the NSA uh, or an honorable mention uh, for, for, uh, for best paper from, from the uh, NSA. And um, you know, these give you a flavor of just, like again, how much more effort we'll spend on even going beyond testing to make sure that things are correct. Um, you know, uh, my friend Byron Cook, who runs the Automated Reasoning Group uh, at AWS, likes to say that you know, um, tests are just what you can think of, but this approach is more like you know Pythagoras' theorem, where you can prove properties are true for like every possible triangle. You know, using these techniques we can prove that things are true for every possible input, right? And really, really convince ourselves of the stability of these systems. It's awesome. Uh, if you want to get a more flavor for this, uh, again, you can look at our S2N repositories. We've got about seven different formal verification and modeling techniques all there, things you can clone and copy if you feel like. Um, it'll give you, um, give you a flavor of what we do. It's pretty cool. And we try to integrate this, too, into our um, continuous integration and, CI CD pipelines. I don't want to leave you the impression that we have to do any of this stuff, uh, you know, rigorously manually or anything like that. It's uh, we try to automate it uh, where we can. So, if you're a close observer of AWS, uh, you won't be surprised by the next uh, pattern. Uh, something that we focus a lot on in data planes actually uh, is is that we focus on a concept we call blast radius, right? Which means um, when we build a service. We don't want the whole service to ever fail at once, right? That would be disastrous. We instead try to compartmentalize the service into some kind of boundary, like cells, right? Um, and design our service in such a way that if there's ever any kind of fault, it'll stay inside that boundary, and, um, and we might lose that proportion of the service, but you know, we should have enough redundancy and resilience to take over, right? And nobody should notice. Uh, my colleague Peter Voschel gave a talk on this last year, just all about uh, how we do this, gets you into way, way, way more detail. Um, if you think about something like our edge network, where we've got our, um, or sorry, our network in general, you know, this is, this is where you know, the scale of AWS really kind of comes to our rescue and helps us out here, right? Because we have uh, you know, as many regions as we do now and as many zones as we do now, um, we're really able to make the blast radius of systems quite small. You know, if you think of the entire surface area of a service, like S3 or Route 53 or, or, or CloudFront or EBS or DynamoDB, anything like that, if you think of the whole surface area as this big you know, uh, yellow rectangle, right? Our kind of default you know, blast radius, like if I just built a Hello World service at AWS using our, our default uh, tools, and our default architectural patterns, our kind of normal blast radius that we would expect is that it's zonal, right? Which means, you know, worst case, a fault will be contained to be between one third and one sixth of the overall surface area, right? Which means, the, and the remainder can take over, right? That's the idea. So that's how something like S3 is architected, for example. Um, or uh, if, if the system is cellular and internally, you know, is split into between like 10 to 100 cells, and we put customers into, into different cells, the blast radiuses can get smaller again, right? So we have systems like Hyperplane, which is this engine that powers uh, systems like Transit Gateway and NLB and NAT Gateway, uh, and that's a cellular system because it's so critical and low level in the network. And there the blast radius is between, you know, one tenth and one hundredth. And at the edge, our default blast radius is now down to about one two hundredth of our all surface area, because in general we're deploying our software, we're operating everything at the pop level, and we've got you know several hundred uh, pops now. Um, but actually, most faults, most things that occur, um, are really just contained at the like server level, 
and are really, really, really small and measured in blast radius because often we'll have a large number of uh, server or servers or workers that are sustaining that service. And actually, a lot of the time when we're architecting services, we'll intentionally choose, and as part of our design, um, use uh, a larger number of small instances. You know, like I'd prefer to use you know 100 small instances than 10 big instances. You know, if they cost roughly the same in dollars. Uh, you know, when I can architect my service like that, I'll have better blast radius. And that's a big part of our thinking. And it just means that, uh, you know, we get this tremendously small amounts of impact and can easily compensate for them with uh, redundancy and resilience um, just in the way we architect. It's awesome. Um, we have a technique called shuffle sharding. I'm actually going to talk about it tomorrow at a, at a series of lightning talks. Or, or, if, or you can search for it if you want to know more. Um, and shuffle sharding is one of our go-to fault isolation patterns. And believe it or not, shuffle sharding uses some really clever math so that the blast radius can actually get down to about one trillionth of the surface area, which is uh, what we do for Route 53 um, at a per customer level. Uh, and it's, it's kind of mind blowing that that's possible. But this is something we focus a lot of attention on. If you went to a design review with a data plane team at AWS, uh, they would know their blast radius, and they, it is something they would think quite a lot about and always be trying to make smaller and smaller. The next kind of technical pattern that you see a lot on these data planes is that, um, you know, blast radius reduction results in this kind of horizontal compartmentalization where everything's in these cells that are well separated and a fault should stay inside the cell. But there's another kind of... Um, separation we can do too, which is kind of a bit more vertical or front to back, which is to make sure that the systems are protected into components that can kind of fail in isolation if they need to. And we try to protect the most sensitive components um, by using this layering. So an example of this, if you looked at the Route 53 architecture at a very high level, it kind of looks like this. You know, we've got a service at our front end API that's taking requests from customers. You know, they send us these SIGV4 signed requests saying, change my DNS record. Uh, that gets stored in a data store, which is part of our config system. And then you know, those, those changes are pushed out as part of a configuration pipeline uh, very quickly, within seconds. At the other side of that, on the, the servers that are actually handling your DNS requests, there's something pulling that configuration, you know, getting the latest changes. Uh, and then separately again, there's the actual DNS server that's answering DNS requests from clients. And if you looked at a high level architectural diagram of the IAM service, right, um, which is a very, very different kind of service, operates at a completely different layer, uh, it looks pretty much identical. It's, doing, it's the exact same arrangement. Um, and the reason for that is we want to make sure, right, that if there's some kind of problem in our system where you know, we accept some input from a customer that we didn't have perfect test coverage for. You know, some input that we never expected and causes badness in our system. We call those poison pills. Um, that that might impact the first layer or, you know, one or two of the layers, but we'll never get as far as the actual uh, data plane itself. And that's really, really critical. Um, you know, Sometimes these requests will show up and we'll detect, oh, that's not something we understand. You just return a 500 and so you get a very simple error like this. Sometimes the front layer will accept it, but then the config layer doesn't, and so on. Sometimes the config layer gets it, but not the config puller. But right at the end, and this is really critical, the interface between these two final layers is generally dumb as rocks, like really, really dumb. We're talking like the, the configuration system basically does as much of the compu computation as possible, all the string processing, really understanding the entire configuration, and turns it into a raw, like in memory data set that a data plane can use, and then just hands it over to the data plane. Uh, and that tends to be quite safe. If that's not enough, and sometimes we're really paranoid, uh, we do something else, which is we actually can run a miniature copy of the data plane itself right at the front, embedded. And we call this pattern our, our poison taste testers. And, and the idea here is when a request comes in, uh, before we accept it from the customer, we serialize it and turn it into the final format that will ultimately be used to serve 
traffic on the data plane, and we feed it to a dummy copy of our data plane. And, and then we ask the dummy dot copy, okay, well, does that make sense? Uh, can I query that record, say? And if it does, we're good. We can accept the change. And if it doesn't, we reject it. You know, so we, we, we get advance notice and something is rejected right at the front door. Um, to get all this right, data formats and schemas can really matter. You know, the looser your, your data interchange formats, if you're just sending around like YAML and JSON documents and, and so on, uh, and those might change over time. You know, you've got a lot of opportunity for error here. Uh, so we have our own format that we call Amazon Ion. It's actually open source. It's on GitHub as well. Um, and uh, it has, you know, 15 years of, of lessons built in. It's got very constrained uh, schemas and very strong typing to ensure that, you know, as few errors as possible could propagate through a system. That's really, really cool. Uh, so another pattern we use, which won't surprise anyone, is that we try to make our data planes just really, really simple, right? We, we don't want to put too much work into them. Uh, the more complex you make that data plane, the more dynamic it can be, um, you know, the more you're uh, risking. This starts uh, by um, saying no to a lot of features, right? You know, these, these data plane teams are, um, you know, just a little less agile than the average team because they know that uh, well, the stakes are so high and availability is so critical that our feature velocity just can't be the same, right? And, uh, and there's good parts to that and there's bad parts to that. You know, bad parts are very easy to understand. That means customers have to wait longer, right? Every, every new feature just takes all that additional testing and we have to really convince ourselves that the feature uh, justifies all that extra work that goes in to adding something to the data plane. Um, but the good part of it, actually, is that resistance can sometimes drive a lot of creativity. You know, teams often are able to work with customers and find different ways to address the need that don't require adding that complexity um, to, to the data plane, which is kind of cool. And we've got some tricks that we do to, like, really make data planes simple, uh, things that you don't see too often in other spaces. You know, one is the, uh, like I mentioned, we don't want a data plane doing too much of a dynamic workload. We don't want it doing having a lot of flexibility in how it works, right? Because there's uh, danger down those paths. And so whenever we're operating on data sets, we actually try to explode and denormalize those data sets as much as possible before they ever get to the data plane. So if you, if you think of a data set that has like several columns in it, right? Well, a very simple way to query that might, to be, might be to do something like put it in a SQL database and you can write queries like, you know, where X equals foo and where Y equals bar, you know, uh, that, that works. But it means uh, you've got this dynamic workload where joins are happening and, uh, and there might be, you know, weird combinations of values that are much more expensive than others and there might be bad things that can happen. Uh, so instead, what we do in a lot of cases is we take all the data and we, you know, pre-compute every combination of it and turn it into a big, gigantic flat lookup table that we can just do simple, like, hash lookups into, uh, both for performance and simplicity. Uh, you know, we do this for how geo lookups work on Amazon Route 53, for example. If we're trying to route you to your lo closest location, it's based on a bunch of things, um, but we condense that data down. We use MapReduce processes to explode these data sets out uh, and make things just really, really simple for the data planes. It's cool. All right, we have just an unreasonable amount of redundancy in these systems. You know, teams um, build uh, just staggering amounts of, of um, redundancy in terms of making sure that, you know, we need to make sure that, well, if a server fails, but also if a rack fails, but also if there's an entire availability zone fails that we're ready, you know, Elastic Load Balancer, for example, is provisioned so that every load balancer could just instantaneously handle the loss of an entire availability zone without really having to do anything, right? And that's, that can seem like an unreasonable amount of redundancy to a lot of people. Um, it's, but, you know, these teams know, no, that's, that's what you got to do. And um, in some areas, we've had to invent new concepts, right? So in our edge locations, where we've got 200 plus edge locations, we actually organize them into stripes. And we say, well, some of our operations, we're going to constrain 
We're never going to operate outside of a single stripe at any time. And if we ever screw up, it'll impact one stripe, but never more than that. And that will make sure that the system will be safe because we can lose a stripe. We've got more than enough capacity uh, to cope. It's really cool. We have other examples of uh, unreasonable redundancy. You know, DNS, where things are very, very critical. We actually have a cache of last resort. Uh, and this is kind of like spatial style programming, right? This is written by a different team in a different programming language from the rest of the data plane. Um, really try to make sure that we couldn't have the same fault in two places. And it just kind of sits in front of the DNS system. And if there's, ever, if there's ever a worst case problem with the DNS system and it just completely fails, thankfully it's never happened, um, you know, this cache could take over. And it would have you know, the last few hours or days of working set in memory. And you know, that's the vast, vast majority of things that are queried. And that could just take over. But these teams, they're so paranoid. They think of everything. You know, they actually think, well, what if the problem's in the cache? What if there's some kind of like runaway problem in the cache and that causes things to fail? So they actually only run the cache on half the fleet. And, and um, that's enough, because uh, the system's designed for 2 redundancy, which is pretty staggering. Uh, another thing these things, teams think about is a concept we call static stability, which uh, just means if something were to fail, if we turn it back on again, it should just come to like a working state. It should go back to the way it was. Um, and that's harder than it seems, especially in distributed systems, where you can have systems that depend on other systems, and you've got dependencies and so on. Right? And so these teams have had to build testing processes that make sure that they have static stability. You know, they are deliberately, like with chaos techniques and so on, you know, deliberately fanning machines and making sure that they really will come back even if they don't have access to anything else. Um, because you, don't, you can't guarantee your dependencies will always be available uh, in those situations. There is one really hard part of this. Uh, so most of this engineering is you know, finding and eliminating unnecessary dependencies, right? But there's one part of it that's really hard, which is you know, we're generally also expected to encrypt our data uh, on, on machines. And we're uh, only supposed to keep the keys in memory, because you know, that's what various compliance standards require. It's kind of thinking of an old school trap model where somebody might physically steal a server. Uh, our you know, data centers have lots of physical security around them, so that's, that's not as much a threat. But that's still how the compliance standards work. Um, and so how do you make a system statically stable right? when everything has to be encrypted, but you can't have a copy of the key? That's a really hard problem. But we actually outsource it to KMS, our key management system, which has been architected. Uh, so we, we accept KMS as one of our few like really low level dependencies, and we count that as part of our static stability framework. Um, but we know we've put a lot of effort into making KMS itself statically stable. It's got all sorts of um, special attention and some extra measures that make sure uh, we can do that, which is, which is really, really uh, awesome. But that's, uh, teams are having to you know, dot all these I's and cross these T's. Um, uh, we, we generally find dependencies not just by you know, uh, chaos engineering and you know, turning off machines and seeing what happens. But we'll do things like look at NetFlow data and CloudTrail logs and kind of the usual AWS techniques to find you know, what's calling what and try to build call graphs and, and make sure that it's, uh, uh, that, it's, that it's all as it should be. But teams spend you know, a, a fair amount of effort on that. And then the last pattern I want to cover is graceful degradation. And I think there's something very profound to this, which is, you know, it's a really good sign of a strong team when they have that humility to realize that you know, their code is not perfect. It's written by humans and uh, will someday fail in some way. And it's not about making failures completely impossible. It's really about making sure that when failures occur that um, you know, service doesn't completely go down and uh, customers are, are totally, um, totally screwed. And so you see lots of, you know, defense in depth and compensating layers and stuff like that. But what I thought was really interesting is how we think about like, extreme load cases. right? So that's a really hard problem. Like, if you're just getting huge amounts of load, more than you can handle, like, what do you do? Like, you could just try to throttle it, but that's not much better than having an outage, because you're still denying service. Um, but you know, by putting thought into it, you're often able to find, actually, I can prioritize work. Right? So a good example of this is on Route 53. 
where our top, top priority always is answering DNS requests. It's the core job of the DNS data plane. If we were to get extreme load, now what actually happens is that we'll you know, isolate that load and we have dedicated capacity um, and uh, really none of this kicks in, but it ever really had to. We will actually uh, deliberately sacrifice some of the other work that's happening on the box. You know, we'll turn off metering, which means uh, we're not keeping track of, of who to charge for the queries, but um, that tends not to matter when you're getting that many queries. And uh, if it really, really came to it, we'd even turn off some of the logging. Because um, if you really had to choose between either not having logging or not having service at all, you'll, you'll, you will choose not having logging, as bad as not having logs is. Um, you know, we still have visibility. We still have metrics into these systems. We can still uh, tell that it's safe and healthy. But we've deliberately prioritized this work like this uh, to keep things uh, uh, as available as we can and really bake it into our thinking. Um, so um, if you don't take anything else away from this, I think um, you know, the biggest things for me are those kind of cultural values, you know, the things that are in the air we breathe and just being relentlessly focused on quality and having it be a, a really strong mark of, of team pride and, uh, some, and something we encourage and promote and you know, encouraging lots of tests having that healthy, open environment where people can raise doubts and suspicions and concerns. Uh, everyone feels heard and respected. Uh, you know, one thing I've learned is uh, how to argue well, you know, and keep, uh, and keep teams um, healthy even as they argue and, and, and have that match with lots of respect. Um, I, all of that is just so unbelievably critical for getting these systems right. Um, and, uh, and for, you know, if you can think about your system as something that's, okay, failures are gonna happen, how do I make sure that those failures don't have consequences? Like limiting the blast radius with compartmentalization and cellularization, or thinking about degrading gracefully from the beginning. Um, you know, if you can build those directly into your design thinking, uh, you really can't get to, you know, beyond five nines and more in these systems. Uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll long continue to. That's everything I had. Uh, thank you all for coming very much. If, if you've got questions, uh, best way is probably gonna be to grab me outside after the end so we can get some more people into this room. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much again.